So um, I want to talk about disruption in education, but I, I don't... Actually, in my third slide, I'm going to destroy my own proposition. I don't, I don't actually believe in this proposition at all, um, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so I'm just going to start. Let's get going. Okay, right. Does anyone recognize this young man? No, I'm not surprised. He's my son. He's my youngest son. I have four sons, and four sons... He's, the eldest is 41, and the youngest is 16. And um, I'm a single parent. Uh, Frank lives with me. He's a high school student. He gets A's... He brought home a progress report um, a couple of weeks ago, and the, there isn't a single letter other than an A on it, except in the names of the subjects. He's a brilliant student at absolutely everything. He's passionate about computer science, higher mathematics and philosophy. He gets the second best mathem higher mathematics mark in the whole school. And he's got boys, that, children there who are three years older than him. I, I think... That's a perfect storm, I think. Computer science, higher mathematics and philosophy. I think I could take him into Google tomorrow and get him a job. No problem. But he can't stand school. Over the last six months, he's, he's had psychosomatic illnesses that put him in bed for a week at a time. Um, he's, he can't get up in the mornings. He's late. He gets punished for being late all the time. Um, I have to deal with him coming home from school at 3.30 in the afternoon, furious, fuming with anger. This is a failure. This is an absolute failure of education. And really, this, he is why education needs to be disrupted. If you have a student that is that bright, that is that motivated, you can see he's a gorgeous, good-looking, happy, motivated, energised young man, and school is absolutely destroying his motivation. That's why education needs disrupting. Something serious needs to happen. Okay, so this is the proposition that actually I want to challenge. Actually, I don't believe this. I don't believe education is a market. I don't believe it's a market at all. Um, and I'll, let me explain that with a little bit of history of my own. We had, we had John earlier um, showing pictures of himself in the 70s with his uh, awful jumper. Well, that's nothing. This is me in the 70s, right, with a, in the circle. Really scruffy long hair. Um, when, I, when my kids were little, I showed them a picture of me around about this time, and they said, who's the man with the long, dark hair? <laughs> um, but this is typical. I, so I went to university in 1971 to 1973, and I was very, very fortunate. It was the sort of... It was the tail end of the 60s, and those liberal, um, radical values of the 60s were still in operation in education. They were still informing... The, how, what education meant. And um, I was very, very lucky. I went to uh, the University of East Anglia. And at the time, I studied English and American studies, but really I specialised in English literature. And at the time, the English literature course was run by a professor called Malcolm Bradbury, who's dead now, but he was also a novelist. He was very... Inf and a critic. He was very influential. And what was amazing about the course was that it completely made these very strong connections between disciplines. So I would do modules on English literature and economic history. So we'd study something like um, the late, late 19th century in England and how, um, how the novelists were explaining society, were explaining this industrialised society. Uh, and we're actually um, documenting the human consequences of economics and economic history. We do courses on literature and psychoanalysis, literature and sociology. And 
I realized, I didn't, it took me a long time, I realized when I was in my early 50s that actually the way I thought and the way I saw the world and the way I made sense of things was completely influenced by that education. By, you know, it looks like I was spent my time growing my hair and playing the electric violin, but no, I, I did learn something and it was how to think and how to interpret the world. And that, 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 so that has had a huge influence over me. So I think I was very, very lucky. I, I, I'm going to say something now that makes me sound like a Marxist. And actually, I don't have a problem with that. No, I, I, that to me, that's not a bad thing. But I think I was very lucky. I had my university education before university in the UK became about preparing people to be cannon fodder for late advanced capitalism. So before, university just became a way of training people to work. And I have, one of my brothers, I have two younger brothers, one of them has been a university lecturer for um, 25, 30 years. So he's seen how the students have changed, how the regime has changed. And he, he, he says exactly the same thing. The students just, just want to get a job. They want to be trained to get a job. That's all they're interested in. And um, I had a very, there was a very, actually quite poignant moment over Christmas. My son, Oscar, who's 21, is in his final year at university, studying English literature at, at another really good university. And um, we were just catching up over Christmas, and uh, I was telling him that I joined a book club. Last summer, I joined a book club, and it's actually, it's, it is actually a left-wing, we read left-wing theory, and uh, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's kind of rebooted my brain. But I was telling Oscar about the, about the book club. Now, bear in mind, this, this boy is at university studying literature, and do you know what he said to me? He said, that must be wonderful. He said, to be in the room with six people and they've all read the book. <sighs> That's terrible, isn't it? That's a terrible indictment. Terrible. So, um, this is... Oh, sorry, there's a rude word on there. I'm going to change this now. Okay. Um, this, is, this is what I do now. This is what I do now. I work with startups. I'm a, an advisor and a, a very, very small scale investor in startups. And um, this is actually me in, um, in Tallinn last, uh, uh, well, I've been in Tallinn twice working with, with, with um, a startup accelerator here called Startup Wise Guys, which is a really good thing. Um, and I mentor on their program. And this was me, I think, yes, this was me last autumn, last October. I was talking about the 10 things that kill startups. And so we, we're on number nine and 10 here. Number nine is ego, right? <laughs> the founder's ego. Actually, this is brilliant. You should look this up. Has anybody here heard about Helsinki bus station theory? Do you know it? Has anyone ever heard of it? No, it's brilliant. It was actually invented by a, it was, it's a serious, stop laughing, it's a serious thing, okay? Um, <laughs> You're spoiling it for everybody else. <laughs> no, it's a serious thing. Um, it was, it was um, formulated by a, 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 a Finnish photographer. And actually, uh, you can look it up online. I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But um, the payoff... Actually, it's a thing about... Um, which is very important to startups, which is um, holding on to your vision and staying consistent. And, and the... The um, payoff of the whole thing is this idea that you stay on the bus, okay? Uh, so that's what I do now. I, I, and bizarrely, where am I? Yeah, okay, no, we, that's okay. Um, bizarrely, and I don't quite, I can't explain how this has happened, I have ended up working with a lot of educational technology startups, which is kind of why I'm here today. This is actually the first time I've uh, addressed any kind of educational audience. Um, 
I mean, I, I am trained, actually I'm properly trained and qualified as a teacher. And I did teach for four terms. I didn't last very long, I'm afraid. <laughs> but I did teach in the late 1970s. So I do have some... I'm qualified to talk to you, okay? <laughs> really. Um, but I, through... But, but somehow, I have... What I do... What, what's happened to me is that I now... I don't exclusively work in, with education or technology startups, but actually, I work with three in London and I'm being paid by an organization there that supports startups, particularly in education and social impact, to um, be a business advisor to these startups. And actually, I'll talk about one of them later. I'm working with an educational technology startup in Budapest, another one in Delhi, and I'm also working with a not, an educational not-for-profit, which I'll talk about again, uh, a bit later, in rural Indonesia. And the one in rural Indonesia, I was over there doing some consulting, and um, I ended up giving half of my fee to this organization, because I was so impressed with the young woman that runs it and what they were trying to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through what they do uh, in a minute. So I, what I'd like to do next, very quickly, is go through 10 attributes of startups which I think could be relevant to education, okay? And I'll just rattle through them and I'll give you a little bit, tiny bit of background to them. But these are just things that I, I mean, I don't have a kind of, I don't have a kind of program for what I'm saying today. It's, I, I, I would like to provoke some thinking and so give you some food for thought. Um, I don't have the answers. I don't have any answers to anything, actually. I mean, it's something you realize you get older. You actually know nothing. And, um, but that's quite liberating, because you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have to pretend anymore. <laughs> that's great. So, startup principles that could be useful for talking about education. I'm glad you're laughing and smiling, because I got, I got the graveyard shift, as we call it. You know, the last... You'd probably all rather be going home, but, and, and actually quite a lot of you already have. But no, I, but I, if, I can, if I can just keep it light and keep you entertained, then I think that's, that's kind of what you need at this time in the day. So this is a, such an important point. This is absolutely, I think, critical. Innovation happens outside the incumbent institutions. So, sorry, I'm using long words here, but, uh, or maybe not quite so obvious words in English. I was actually encouraged earlier to use really long words and speak very quickly to challenge the translators at the back there, yeah? Hi. <laughs> but no, innovation, I, actually I've done both. I, I was for five years, I was the director of innovation for a, a global group of um, companies. So I spent five years trying to generate innovation inside a corporate structure. Total failure, absolute failure. There were so many barriers and so many people who were invested emotionally, financially, professionally in keeping things the way they were. So many barriers. So innovation needs to happen it happens fastest, it happens best outside of the, the, the existing institutions. Um, this is another startup principle that many existing products and modes of delivery are losing their relevance. So a good example of this would be Blockbuster and Netflix. Blockbuster and Netflix. Blockbuster hung on to their model of having physical stores and physical product that you went and you borrowed. I used to get into so much trouble with Blockbuster because I always forgot to take the things back. I always forget to take things back and get fined. So I take a film out, it cost me 20 pounds, 25 euros, ridiculous. Now I have Netflix. Um, did you know that, I mean, this is amazing statistic, but when when there are peak times for traffic on Netflix, it can account for 30% of the whole traffic over the entire internet. So when they're streaming something that's really popular, it's huge. So a lot of opportunities are created because the existing product or service, I'm 
put products in inverted commas because it really applies to anything you make and um, sell to people or deliver to people. Losing their relevance. Okay. This is a quote from Mark Andreessen, who is one of the most successful technology investors in the United States. And he said a couple of years ago, software is eating the world. Software is eating the world. And what he meant was that everything is becoming transformed by technology. Everything. Nothing is safe. Nothing is the same. Nothing will be the same. Technology, wherever technology can make something more efficient, faster, easier, quicker, more shareable, that will happen. It's a sort of unavoidable, almost law of, of business. Lower barriers to entry, it's increasingly easy to build technology. A lot of the technology you need to start new things has already been built. You don't have to build it, you just buy it off the shelf. You can buy it off the shelf for 50 euros a month. If you think about storage, think about the storage of... Um, we, we had a mention of data earlier, the new oil. But storing data, you used to have to have. You have to, used to have to buy a physical piece of equipment, a server, and have it in a room that had to be at a controlled temperature. Now, you just rent that space off Amazon or off Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Cloud Services. You just you, you rent that stuff, and it costs you a few euros a month. And if you suddenly have, suddenly your website is hugely successful, and you need 100 times more capacity, you just pay for more. You just buy it. So it's easier and easier for com new competitors to come into any market and kick the ass of the companies or institutions that have, have controlled it. And the, there are innumerable examples of that in the music business, in travel, in shopping, retail. Um, why should education be any different? Education isn't exempt. Users don't know what it is they need. They can't tell you what to build. This is another sort of fundamental rule of startups. And really, the, the, the person that really kind of um, set the tone for this was Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs would not he would never have focus groups at Apple. He said, the users, our consumers, our uh, customers don't know what they want. They don't know what they want. It's up to us. Which means, um, and this is a really important point, I think, startups don't work by doing research, by doing a priori research. It's, they, 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 they find their solutions by understanding people using their own knowledge, their common sense, their intuition, to understand what people might want and try it. Give it to them, experiment, see if they like it. Change it if they don't. Okay. Have, you, have, have any of you heard of Agile, which is a sort of methodology for um, creating software? Okay. This, is, th this again, is fundamental to startups. The, the whole point about Agile is that you try things. You start with one, with the, the minimum that you can do, and then you get it out there, you test it, and then you, um, you iterate. So you then do it again, better. You incorporate the feedback from your first group of users. And this is very well understood in the in the software world and in the, and, and in the financing of software. I, I'm invested in a startup in Hungary. They've just raised 250,000 euros in investment. Guess how many paying users they have? <laughs> One. <laughs> One. Because the people that are funding them understand that, you know, there's a process. It's a process and they will, they will learn what they can, iterate, get some more users, and so on. Okay. Make lots of experiments. So this is really, this is, this is really important. Um, low cost, quick experiments to see what works, 
Sometimes you do it manually. Sometimes you fake it. Um, if you've heard, have you heard of Airbnb? Do you know what that is? No? Yes? Airbnb is a, is a, is a website where you can basically sleep on people's couches or you know, rent their apartments for three days or whatever if you're, if you're staying anywhere. It's fantastic. If you're going, if you, you're going to a conference in Berlin or something, you, 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 know, you borrow somebody's apartment. And it's now a, it's a huge global business. It's worth billions. But how they started was they just went out and knocked on doors in the neighborhood around their office and said, have you got a spare room? They didn't even have any technology when they started. And yet they built a multi-billion dollar business on that. So fail fast. If something's not going to work, get that out of the way quickly, and then move on, learn. Okay? Um, how many users is the most important metric? So there was a lot of, a lot of people were really puzzled by the purchase by Facebook of, of, of a utility called WhatsApp for $19 billion, okay? $19 billion. But WhatsApp has had at the point of purchase 450 million users. 250 million active users at any one time. And it goes back to, to your point about data and about the clicks. That is hugely valuable. There's no revenue. There's no revenue. Um, there was a wonderful note that the, one of the founders of WhatsApp pinned to the workstation of the other founder when they started. And it just said three things. But one of them was no advertising and actually proved to be one of their massive strengths because they were, their audience is teenagers and they don't want commercial messages messing up their communication with each other. So just, so what Facebook saw was the value, the inherent value in that user base, that huge user base. Okay, we're nearly, we're nearly at the end of this bit. It gets kind of, it gets a bit more interesting after this, this is a boring bit. Um, so I said this already, test, iterate, test, iterate, and when your product is good enough, then you go for it, then you scale it. And this is, this is quite often when you need investment, because this is the point where you want to go big as quickly as possible, because it's like that's the way you secure your competitive advantage. All this old world stuff about IP and copyright, it's absolutely meaningless in this world meaningless. And I still, you know, I find startup founders who are obsessed with intellectual property. Forget it. Forget it. Get it out there and just scale so quickly that you're comp nobody can keep up with you. That's the way to get commercial advantage. Okay, so that's it. That's the boring bit over. So these are kind of like the, these are the, some of the key principles about the startup world and how startups operate. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you um, three projects that I'm involved with, three startups that I'm involved with that are in the education world. And I'm just going to tease out which, which aspects of the startup process they use uh, to build their thing. I mean, one of them is a business, two of them are social enterprises. So the first one, uh, and this is the one I mentioned in rural Indonesia, it's called Ed Edwashen. Actually, it's a terrible name. I, I, I actually spend lots of time, I did this yesterday with a startup founder here in, um, in Tallinn. I spend an awful lot of time trying to sort out people's English, actually. Because I work with lots of non-English, but you know, lots of startups where English isn't their first language. Um, you can imagine in rural Indonesia, it's, 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 it's quite a long stretch. So um, Erica, the young woman that runs this, bless her, she combined the word art and education and came up with this mouthful, which is really is not very elegant in English. What she does... What she does in, um, in rural Indonesia, for, she runs a school, okay? She runs a, it's actually an after-school private college for supplementary lessons. The, the, the state education is there, but it's very basic. 
And I think, the, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but this seems to happen across all the developing world. It hap I know it happens in Africa, that um, the very basic um, provision is, is supplemented, people supplement it by paying, okay? And the profits from this school, from her school, and it's quite successful. Um, and it's, it, it all takes place in this kind of, sort of bamboo castle that they built. And they built it themselves with their own hands, her, her and her team. It's pretty, pretty, pretty impressive stuff. Um, and this is her team here. Um, what they do with the profits is they produce these things, mind maps. And what her, her idea was that, because she's also an artist, she's a painter, was to create educational materials that were 90% visual. 90% visual. Uh, she's working with, you know, semi-literate communities, and she wanted a solution to compressing the curriculum, different parts of the curriculum, into a, a visual form rather than a, a verbal form. And um, the World Bank has picked up on this, and they they fund her to go into the, the very undeveloped part of um, Indonesia, which is Papua, which sort of like on the map is the other half of Papua New Guinea. This is rainforest, very, very, um, you know, basic communities. Uh, and um, that she's developed, she's got about 300 of these that cover every aspect of, of both the general and specialized curriculum. And the project that we're working on together is to create an open source platform for these, these non-verbal teaching materials and use her materials to kind of kick that off, to set that going, but create an open platform for where, where anybody that's creating those kind of materials can upload them and people that are working with those kind of communities can just use them. And uh, we're just at the, pro at the point where I'm talking to various people in the UK and in Europe about what's the best way to do that um, technically. So it's a, it's a, it's a real project. Um, so that's the first one. Um, and I, I would say these, these are some of the principles, that the startup principles that are actually being, that I think are, are working through this um, this social enterprise. So definitely an example of the innovation being driven outside the institutions. And it's interesting that the World Bank, which is supporting her now, recognizes this as well. They're not trying to do this inside. They're, they're supporting her as an outside independent um, organization to do it. Um, understanding users, they're able to test these with their, um, with their pupils. Um, they do lots of experiments, they, they hold their own events and exhibitions, they use the school to trial stuff, they use their staff to create stuff. Um, technology, technology in Indonesia is unbelievable. They've gone straight from like a rural artisan economy to a digital economy, and they've missed out all that messy industrial bit in between. It's quite amazing, and I, I saw entrepreneurs there that literally came from a village were designing something like shoes and had a, an online shop. And they're selling stuff globally, selling stuff in Europe and America. Incredible. Um, but um, in rural areas, mobile is very common. Um, so people have internet access via their mobile. And they use um, communication platforms like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger a lot. Um, they don't have any way of. Uh, building technology in a kind of IT, corporate IT way. They don't have that kind of money. Um, they have to, they have to, the startup term is bootstrap. They have to bootstrap their, um, their enterprise just with tiny bits of profit that they make from the school. Maybe, a, you know, 100 euros here, 50 euros there. Um, so a smart, low-cost approach is really necessary. Okay, the second one. This is, this is one, of the com one of the organizations I'm being paid to give business support to in the UK. They're called Code Club. And what they're doing is they're 
setting up in primary schools for children aged 9 to 11 clubs to, do you have it here? Yeah? Has it started here? Yeah? So they're, they're, setting, up, they're setting up clubs for um, children just before they go to secondary school to learn how to code. Okay? And this is obviously, this whole coding thing is a big movement now. There's a big movement to, um, to it's called, in, in, in England, it's called the digital makers movement. And it's getting young children not just to consume digital stuff, but to also make it. And this is hugely successful. Um, in 18 months, they have 2,200 primary clubs in primary schools, after-school clubs. Um, and they are, again, this has happened outside of the education establishment with two programmers who got together and just did it spontaneously with no money. And they've built it up to the point where this year, this year, they've got just under a million pounds. So something like 1.2 million euros in funding. And that's from a standing start 18 months ago. Um, they're dealing with, an, with a real, a lot of competition for children's attention outside school. So, but their growth rates, I mean, they're, they're, put, they're growing at the rate of one, somewhere between one and 200 clubs a month. So, they are really um, impacting on children who have lots of other things to do with after 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, the existing products like the curriculum, just not dealing with this. Um, software already runs the world of the 9 to 11 year old. That's it. Software's already eaten their world. Everything they do is online, it's digital, or it's digitized in some way. And the, the Code Club acknowledges that reality and builds on that by giving them access to how those things are made. So it's instead of fighting the reality and saying, oh, they should be reading books. I had, this, I had this with Frank. I had this with Frank two years ago when he was really into computer games and he was playing Call of Duty endlessly, shooting people virtually. And I said to him, this is a typical di dialogue between me and Frank, right? So I said to him, you are not reading enough. He said, yes, I am. Okay, all right. Okay, what are you reading? He said, to kill a mockingbird. Okay, so I said, right, what's it about? He then launched into a 15-minute explanation of racial uh, tensions in the, in the, in, in, in the southern American states. He explained the whole background to the book. So I said, yes, but you're only reading it because it's on the curriculum. And he said, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. You can't win. But um, no. Uh, and I've just written a proposal. I delivered it a couple of days ago for the... Prime Minister's Office, the UK government, um, because the UK government is really interested in putting a big chunk of money into this to scale it fast. So I've written a proposal we could get this to 80% of UK primary school children in three years with an investment funding of about £3 million. So we'll see where that one goes. But that's the equivalent of getting your Series A investment into your startup to scale. I was talking about earlier. Finally, um, a, a, a startup that I met here last year in Estonia on, a, on, a, a, on, on the startup accelerator program that I mentor on. You know, you saw the picture earlier. They're based in Delhi, uh, in India. And what they're doing is they're, they've created a search engine for open access research papers. Now, if you're a student in the developing world, the cost of accessing, if you're a graduate student, the cost of accessing research papers is completely insane. It, so, for instance, it might cost you $30 to just access one paper, and a student, a, a, a graduate student in India is living, is, their total budget per month is maybe $250. It's impossible. So what these guys have done is they've, they're, they're picking off academic institutions one by one and 
persuading them to adopt an open access policy. Rather than selling the articles for publication to Reed or Pearson, Reed made three billion in three billion um, euros in operating profit last year. It's a very profitable business, this stuff. But it's absolutely pricing developing world graduate students out of the market. And that has a massive social impact because what it means is that actually, in terms of things like science and medicine, the solutions to the problems that those countries face are actually, they end up getting developed in the West and then sold back to them because they can't develop the, grad, you know, the level of graduate students to solve their own issues around clean water or poverty or whatever it is. So this, this potentially has massive social impact. At the moment, it's just a search engine. And in six months, they've got 50,000 users and 3 million articles on their database. It's hugely popular, and it's, it's meeting a demand that clearly was ready to go. Um, so again, the existing products and the way they're distributed, the business model around them is not relevant anymore. They've, they've got a very agile approach to technology. They're using very small amounts of funding. They've been on two startup accelerator programs. I think they've probably had 10,000 euros from each one. Um, and they mostly recruit their users by word of mouth. But they've got these fantastic um, statistics. And they also illustrate one startup principle. I've nearly finished, don't worry. Won't be long, um, only a couple of minutes. Um, they, another startup principle I didn't mention earlier, which is grow your user base and then monetize. Then monetize. So you, you get your users, then you build a business on. These guys are going to create, a, they're, they're building a set of tools for publication so that, peop, so, so, so that people will pay to have a set of publication tools. And that, that's where the revenue will come from. And they'll share that revenue with the universities who of, will lose revenue by not selling to Reed and Pearson. So those are my three examples. They're, they're all from my personal work. They're, 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 I'm involved in different ways with them, and I'm working with them right now. So finally, I mean, I, it's sort of customary, isn't it, to draw some grand conclusions uh, at the end of these things. And I don't have any, I'm afraid. I, go, I, I, I come back to Frank. Get rid of that. Um, I come back to Frank and um, his dilemma. Um, education is failing him, and for me that means, it, and it's such a fundamental failure that I believe only disruption. Uh, how, how many of you have heard the phrase creative destruction? Have any of you heard that? It was coined by um, an economist called Joseph Schumpeter. Um, and it's, it's all about how it was an economic, it's an economic theory about how capitalism continually kind of re reaches a point where it, it, it stops innovating, it stops, it stops invent reinventing itself, and things have to fall apart and start again. You, saw, you can see that so clearly. It's exactly what happened in the music business, um, you know, four or five years ago. So I think... Personally, I think that we need to restore some of those values in education that are about, the Greeks had a word for it. There was a Greek word for it, and this is, this is especially for you, this, this word, yeah? Um, but they probably won't translate it, they'll just say it's a Greek word. <laughs> it's, it's eudaimonia, eudaimonia. And it, it, it's, it means human flourishing. It means human flourishing. So what it means is that everybody gets to become the best of who they are, the best of their essence. That's what I think education is about. And I think education needs disrupting. Frank needs it to be disrupted so that he can flourish. That's it. Thank you. It's very funny. Some, we, we have just one microphone. Maybe you could, could take over yeah, my, ro cool. my, my role as well yeah, now. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, 
I, l listen, <laughs> we were joking about this earlier because I've, no, I've talked, I, I've talked in Estonia before and I know that people don't ask questions. I know, I know people don't ask questions, but tomorrow I'm speaking at a conference in Helsinki. And if, if, if you think you guys are quiet, the Finns are like, I mean, it, Finnish audit, a Finnish audit. I would hate to be a Finnish stand-up. Surely that doesn't exist. You can't be a stand-up in Finland. <laughs> Nobody responded. So please, be, be better than the Finns and ask some questions, yeah? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, startups are my area also, so it's excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, so Bye. it's um, it's very inspiring to hear this. Uh, I want to ask this. Uh, you said about disruption. Yes. Uh, education sector is mainly uh, public uh, sector. Yes, yeah, sure. And uh, startups usually are too small, and it is very difficult to disrupt the public sector as the um, I don't know big and uh, you don't have a private market there. No, sure, uh, sure. How, how do you see how the uh, startups could uh, just push their uh, leg between the door? Okay, open yeah. the door. Well, I think, I think it's already happening. I mean, you can see it's already happening, happening with some of these um, uh, companies that I'm, an organization that I'm talking about. Uh, I, I guess it's it's about whether you think that education just happens in the institutions. Because I agree with you, the institutions are going to take much longer to change. But I, so I think it, it's the same pattern, really, as in the business world, that actually the innovation and the disruption happens outside of the mainstream to start with. And then what's outside becomes, becomes mainstream. But you, you have to... Um, the experiments have to start outside, I believe. And, um, and, and that, you know, like Code Club, that happens outside school. Okay, some of the volunteers are teachers, but a lot of the volunteers are programmers. But that's, that's you know, the two young women that started Code Club weren't gonna wait for the, the educational system to wake up and realized that children needed to make digital things as well as consume them. Yeah? A paying customer problem. In what sense? I mean, in a sense that uh, usually, uh, mainly people are used to that. Uh, education is uh, free, uh, free of charge. But uh, if you are running a startup, you have to find a paying customer. The one way is that, okay, uh, usually government will pay it, but they won't accept your solution. Okay, but actually there's a good analogy there because, um, as I said, you know, take the example of the guys I'm working with in Budapest. They have, they, they have received, you know, a quarter of a million euros in investment. And they have one paying user. It, it, and and uh, Code Club in the UK, a million pounds worth of investment from companies like Google, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, the service is totally free. No, no child or parent pays for that. So there are, there are ways around this. I think there are ways around it. And there are, um, there are other actors in that field with money who realize that there's another agenda. And, and, and so already, in a sense, there's competition. Yeah? It's not a perfect analogy, but, uh, but I think it, it, it does work. <coughs> Anybody else? Thank you for that, because you like broke the you broke the rule, really. <laughs> yes. Steve, um, b before you said that uh, the users usually don't know what uh, what they want. Mm. Um, what In the startup think? world, yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think? Should we encourage, or how should we encourage uh, high school students to start with startup companies, so that they could? Uh, because they are the users, mm, and they, yeah. I, I, um, I think that they do know that they want to change something, sure. and they probably have ideas, sure. but how to encourage them to uh, actually um, take the step and start with uh, our, their own companies? Sure. Well, actually, this is already happening in the UK, and um, my, one of my sons, uh, Felix, who's 19, has been, he's just left school, and he's 
having a gap year uh, before university, and he's, he, he was earning money before. He's, he's gone off traveling now. He's in Japan at the moment. But he earned money working in a social enterprise that actually gets student entrepreneurs up and running in high schools. And what, what they do is they open, um, do you know what a tuck shop is? Do you know what a tuck shop is? No, it's, a, it, it, it's basically like a little sweet shop and snack shop in a school. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're supporting students to start their own businesses, very simple businesses where you're just selling stuff and you're, you know, you've, got, you've got your customers and you've got a you know, very direct relationship with your users. But they're, they're, they're nurturing entrepreneurs within high schools. So th I think it's entirely possible. I mean, it doesn't, you don't need much money. You can, you can you, you know, you've got, you've, you've, you've got um, students that can code, like Frank. Frank can code. Um, and so it just needs the, uh, that agenda to be identified as being important. That's what it needs. But it is, but people are starting to do it. Okay? I'll give you the, I'll show you the, I'll, I'll give you the link to that thing, because it's really interesting. So would you not mind if uh, <coughs> other people who would have questions just turn to you personally? So you no, that's fine. I think people would like to go home. It's 20 to yeah. 5 on a Friday. So, because I personally we'll start have, the weekend. Have, a, have a question as well. Do so, you? Yeah, okay. no, 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 not public. Not public. Okay. Not yeah. okay. Well, for me so, or for them? So I would uh, now <coughs> have another two seconds. Oh, right, okay.